What, you thought we were going on to adventure next? No, 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 of course not. We got so many other games to talk about before we get to that. I did say this series was going to be covering every mainline Sonic game, and when I said every, I meant every. Though, I guess you could argue whether or not these games count as mainline Sonic games. I guess it really depends on what you consider to be a mainline Sonic game. What constitutes a mainline Sonic game versus a spin-off? What does it need to be? Is it a genre? Does it need to be a platformer? Does it need to have those classic physics from the original Genesis games? Does it need to follow the same level design philosophy and stuff like that? Honestly, I couldn't really tell ya, and I don't think any other Sonic fans out there could either, because you basically ask anybody what they consider mainline Sonic games, and you're gonna get different answers from every person, just based on what they think. I mean, some people don't consider CD to be a mainline Sonic game. I think most people do, but some people don't. And there are so many other games that are, like, kind of half and half and weird. I don't know if you would consider them mainline or not, and... You know, I could easily skip over them and not cover them, but you know what? I decided, no. I want to be as conclusive as I possibly can with this series. I want to cover as many freaking games as I can possibly justify in this series. So, if you could possibly consider it a mainline Sonic game, we're gonna be talking about it. Though, for the games that are a bit more questionable, I probably won't go as in-depth on them, because I probably don't really have as much to say. Uh, and that's why in this video, I'm gonna be covering all of the 8-bit Sonic platformers that were released, all in one video, because... Eh, they don't really have as much going on as the, you know, the main Genesis slash Sega CD you know, original Sonic games. They're not quite all the way there. Anyway, enough preamble, let's actually start talking about this game here, the 8-bit version of Sonic 1. I guess one thing really quickly to mention before we get started on this game is how to play these games, because all of the 8-bit Sonic games, for the most part, were released on the Sega Master System and also the Game Gear, because those two systems were basically the same thing. Just, you know, different hardware. One was a home console, one was a portable. But in terms of, like, the machines and how they actually operated and functioned and power-wise, they were basically identical, which is why lots of 8-bit Sega games got versions on both of those systems. But the systems do have minor differences from each other, and so, you know, you gotta ask the question, which is the proper version of these games to play? And honestly, prior to this video, I wasn't even really 100% sure myself, so for this game, I actually experimented. I played both versions of the game, for the Master System and for the Game Gear. And the biggest and most prominent difference between playing these different versions, you'll see here, this is the Master System version, and here is the Game Gear version. The Game Gear, because it was a handheld, has a much lower resolution, which results in a much crunched down screen where you cannot see nearly as much as the level around you when you're platforming. And that can be a real problem for a fast-paced platformer like a Sonic game would be. So that right there would normally just immediately make me go to the Master System. But thankfully nowadays, through the power of emulation, you can actually, in certain emulators, run Game Gear games at Master System resolutions. That's how similar these two machines were to each other. And so when you do that, you get the full Master System field of vision, but you get the benefit that the Game Gear has, which is a higher color palette, so, you know, colors pop a little bit more on the Game Gear version of the game. You can also see that the sprite art was altered a little bit between the Master System and Game Gear versions of the game, because they were trying to, you know, accommodate for the different screen resolutions to try to still make it look good. And yeah, with this stretched Game Gear resolution, you can see that the HUD is kind of like in the middle of the screen, because it's hard positioned in the game's code to be where the Game Gear resolution has it set to, so the HUD is not properly in the corner, Personally, I don't find that too distracting, but I could see that really annoying some people. And as you might have picked up by this point, it also is kinda glitchy. This resolution stretch for Game Gear emulators, it kinda works on a game-by-game -game basis. Some games it works better for than others. Here in 8-Bit Sonic 1, you can see that certain objects like enemies and platforms and stuff kinda 
pop in and out once they enter the Game Gear's resolution, but once they extend out to the Master System resolution, they disappear. And also, if you look, the top of the screen kind of freaks out sometimes when it's scrolling and stuff, so... Not exactly ideal. Anyway, after playing both versions of the 8-bit Sonic 1 back-to-back, -back, I would generally say that I would recommend the Master System version over the Game Gear version. Though it's not a huge deal, you can totally play either and they're both fine. But I just kind of prefer the Master System version. The sprite art is nicer because it's actually illustrated for this resolution. The HUD being properly in the corners is nice. And there are slight level design modifications that they did for the Game Gear version of the game to make it fit that screen a little bit better. As well as very minor tweaks to the mechanics and such, and I kind of just prefer how the Master System version of the game plays. So, my recommendation for Sonic 1? Master System version. Alright, now we can start talking about the game, and really, I don't have that much to say about the 8-bit Sonic 1. I mean, first thing I need to say is that some people will say that this is the 8-bit version of Sonic 1, and is, you know, the counterpart to the 16-bit version of Sonic 1, but I really don't like referring to games like this with that kind of terminology, because this is not a different version of the Sonic 1 that I've already covered, Make no mistake, this is a different video game, completely. It has different mechanics, different gameplay, different level design, different physics, different everything. This is a completely different game. And also, this was not made by Sonic Team, which you can pretty easily tell when you scrutinize the game, because it's very different in its ideas uh, from what a Sonic game should be based on what the main games were going for. Because I've already talked at length about those games and all their focus on speed and replayability and all that stuff. But the 8-bit Sonic 1 is not really like that very much. This, to me, is more of just a straight 2D platformer with kind of an attempt at doing Sonic-y style things. But it's very clear that these developers, they got like the cliff notes of what the Sonic game is supposed to be, you know? You play as a blue hedgehog, you go fast, you go left to right, and that's about it in terms of similarities to the actual proper Sonic 1. I mean, there are some carryovers, like Sonic does still accelerate up to his default speed, and you can roll down hills and, you know, exceed your normal speed and stuff like that, but one thing I have to make clear is that you know, the Master System and Game Gear were 8-bit machines, they were not as powerful as the Genesis was. There was no way in hell they were going to be able to get those proper sonic physics on these 8-bit machines. And so, the physics are not even close to what they are in the proper Sonic games. This is not real momentum and, you know, conversion and application and all that stuff. It really does not work like the proper Sonic games, like, almost at all. You accelerate, you can go downhill for speed, but it pretty much ends there. There is so much that just does not function how it should in your mind based on playing the proper Sonic games prior to this. And so to really come to grips with this game, and all of the 8-bit games, honestly, you kind of have to, like, throw aside your already existing knowledge about Sonic games and just look at this game for what it is as its own game and just take it as face value. And when you do that, you end up with a fairly enjoyable 2D platformer. It obviously pales in comparisons to the 16-bit Sonic games, but I still find this game to be very enjoyable to just play through. I'll say here right now, I do not really bother with Time Attack for any of these 8-bit games, because, as I said, the design is not there, the level design philosophy is not there, the physics are not there. These are just not, you know, really what I would call Sonic games. Like I said, they're just fun 2D platformers. And so I just enjoy them in that way. I do not try to go for good times here. I just play through the game beginning to end and I have a good time. Oh yeah, another thing that's completely different from the proper Sonic games is how coins work. Because on an 8-bit system, there was no way they were going to get 32 coins to explode out of you when you get hit. So, just one pops out, and it immediately disappears, so there's no recollecting your coins in this game. You get hit, you're down to zero, gotta collect more, that's just how it works. 
Just like the physics, there's lots of compromises because the hardware was just not powerful enough to properly have those Sonic staples that you expect in a Sonic game. Another thing I should mention, because this is going to be very relevant for all of these 8-bit games going forward, they all have real problems when it comes to performance. All of these games suffer from a significant amount of slowdown pretty regularly, and that can be pretty problematic a lot of the time. I mean, you know, usually they're relatively smooth, but slowdowns are frequent. Even if they're not very bad or very long, it's very rare that you get a long, smooth experience when you play these 8-bit Sonic games. The hardware is just not there. It's unfortunate, but it just comes with playing these games. That's another reason I can't really take them too seriously as a Sonic game, because they just kind of feel very janky in how they work with the messed up physics and the sloppy performance and just so many issues like that. But at the end of the day, even with all these problems, I enjoy 8-Bit Sonic 1. It's a good time. I like it. And you know, it does still have Chaos Emeralds in the game, but weirdly, you actually just find them hidden in the levels, which is very weird. Oh yeah, and by the way, I totally forgot to mention that structure-wise, the game is similar to the proper Sonic games. You know, it's got zones and acts. All these 8-bit games, you know, follow that structure, including boss fights with Dr. Eggman at the end of each zone. And of course, we have to ask the question, are the boss fights in the 8-bit Sonic 1 any good, since it's a totally different game? Are they better than the 16-bit games? I mean, I'll give them this at least. They don't give you any coins in Act 3 of the levels, so when you get to the boss fight, you can't afford to take any hits, just like the final boss of Sonic 2. But these bosses aren't like complete and total bullshit like that boss was. So it actually kind of ends up working out pretty okay in these games. Like, it's still a little bit on the brutal side with the punishment, because any mistake means you die. But it also means that you actually have to properly fight the boss instead of just throwing yourself at it and just ignoring damage. So it ends up actually kind of working a bit better. Like, if anything, I'd say that... I guess these bosses are better than what's in the 16-bit games, just because you kind of have to actually fight them, and, you know, they're kind of okay? Eh? By the way, this game does have special stages, but as I said, you just find the Chaos Emeralds hidden in the levels, so all these are really for is to get extra lives and continues and stuff. Uh, so... Uh, whatever, but I mean, at least they're platforming. Like, I'll take that over all the shitty mini games that you get in the 16 bit games. Like, hey, I'm doing normal Sonic stuff in these special stages. That's a little bit more up my alley. If we could do more stuff like this, I'd be more okay with the special stages in the Sonic games. Because I just hate those fucking mini games so goddamn much. It does need to be said that this game does have Labyrinth Zone in it, and it's very similar to the 16-bit version of Labyrinth Zone. And boy howdy, if you thought that the 16-bit Labyrinth Zone was bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh boy, it is really bad in this game. The combination of Labyrinth Zone's just general shittiness and the slowness of the underwater combines with the already poor physics of the 8-bit games and the fact that they have performance issues and constant slowdown in general means that all of the water zones in these 8-bit games are kind of miserable. Like, they are worse than any of the 16-bits water zones, no matter how bad you might think Labyrinth Zone is. You have experienced nothing until you get to the 8-bit water zones. They are pretty universally terrible, I must say. But I wouldn't say any of them are enough to drag down the experiences overall. Except maybe one. But we'll get to that. And that's about it for 8-Bit Sonic 1. It's alright! I'd recommend a casual playthrough of this game. You can hunt down the Chaos Emeralds if you want, but I don't really think it's necessary. Like always with Sonic 1, you just get the good ending and it doesn't do anything, so you can totally pass on it and that's just fine. On to 8-Bit Sonic 2! So for 8-Bit Sonic 2, my recommendation is to play the Game Gear version with the Master System resolution. That's definitely the way to go for this one, because on the Master System, Sonic 2 was only released uh, in Europe, and that means that it only runs at PAL frame rates, meaning the game runs at 50 frames per second instead of 60. 
And fuck that. Uh, so 8-bit version is definitely Game Gear is what you want to go for. And thankfully, this time around, there are way less differences between the Game Gear and Master System versions. They're basically one-to-one -one identical, the exact same game. So the only difference is the resolution, which you can then fix with emulators, so you just get the game at a higher frame rate than if you play the Master System version. So... that's what you want to go for. Now, 8-Bit Sonic 2, this one is a significant step up from the first game. Uh, first of all, I want to say that this game has a very infamous track record with a lot of people, because since the Game Gear version is the only thing that came out in North America, it means that people only played the Game Gear version with that crunched down resolution, and the game is really not designed for it in how the level design works. And so this game has had a very negative response from a lot of people because you just can't see shit playing it on proper Game Gear, and that just makes it horrible. But playing it with Master System Resolution totally fixes that, and I actually think this is the best of the 8-bit Sonic games. This game is really good and the closest to one of the proper 16-bit Sonic games that any of these games managed to come. The physics are better than what they were in the 8-bit Sonic 1, still not one-to-one -one accurate to the 16-bit games, but closer and they definitely feel better. This is actually the first game to have loops in it on these 8-bit systems, though they don't work with proper physics at all. They're basically entirely scripted once you enter the loop, because the, the, the physics cannot actually handle real looping. So it's basically you walk onto the loop and then you lose control of your character as they automatically go through it. And that's how it is in all these 8-bit games, because the physics are just not there to support that kind of thing. Though, even though this is Sonic 2, just like Sonic 1 8-bit, this is not the same game as Sonic 2. It's totally its own game. And unfortunately, even though it was released alongside Sonic 2, you got no spin dash here, so it does kind of feel a bit more like, you know, original Sonic 1 like that, but whatever, it works for this game, it's fine. Anyway, performance-wise, this game runs the best out of any of these 8-bit Sonic games. This game actually manages to run fairly smoothly most of the time, so that just improves playability and makes it feel better. But the biggest thing for me with this game that makes it so much better than all the other 8-bit games is the level design, because this game really does kind of lean into the proper Sonic level design, the multi-tiered paths and the encouragement for replay value and trying to stay on the high paths that are the faster, more difficult path, this game actually kind of manages to do that relatively well. It emulates that type of design for Sonic pretty consistently. It's still not something that I care to invest a ton of time really learning the time attack, because the physics are still pretty whack, and the level design isn't, like, super-duper incredible like the 16-bit games, but it's serviceable, and it feels much more like a real Sonic game in that way. So it just all around feels like this is what I would want from Sonic on a weaker 8-bit machine when you compare it to the 16-bit machines. This is pretty good! Oh yeah, and there's no option for having Tails follow you around in this game, because come on, there's no way in hell they were going to manage to have an AI companion follow you around in this game when it's already sometimes struggling to run just the game itself. We're on much more limited hardware here, so that's totally understandable, and it doesn't really matter because Tails sucks anyway, so it's fine. Also a thing this game introduces that a lot of the future 8-bit games carry on, that I don't really know why they implemented is that instead of running along water at high speed, you can skip along it in a ball form, like kind of like a pebble would. And I guess it's kind of cool, but I don't really know what the point of this is. Why don't you just make Sonic run along the water? Uh, but it's something unique, so that's something. And hey, look, in this game, when you take a hit, your coins actually fly out and you can recollect them. Only, like, five of them maximum fly out, because we're still on 8-bit hardware here, but eh, this is kind of cool. Sonic 2 8-bit, a significant step up. I like it. It's pretty good. Definitely recommended by me. Although I do have to say, the second-to-last zone in the game, Egg Scramble Zone, is horrible. It has the worst level gimmicks I've ever seen in any Sonic game. It has these tubes that you have to enter, and you can manipulate which direction Sonic goes on intersections, 
but you go so fast through these tubes that you can barely identify what the hell is happening, and you get these really complicated sections where you have all these tubes interconnected with each other, and it's just trial and error trying to figure out what path is the right way to go. And if you take the wrong path, that could just throw you back down at the beginning of the level and you gotta replay a bunch of shit, or they'll throw you into spikes or death pits, it's just... Oh my god, this zone is so bad. But the rest of the game is fairly good, and actually, something I almost forgot to mention, this game has the best reward for collecting the Chaos Emeralds of any of these games so far. Because in this game, when you get all the Chaos Emeralds, you unlock a final zone. You actually get a significant extra little thing that you unlock. More levels to play. Now we're talking. Now that is a reward. And it's actually a totally fine zone. It doesn't suffer from the fucked up shit of Egg Scramble Zone. So hey, it's actually worthwhile to collect the Chaos Emeralds in this game for once. And you don't even have to do any shitty special stages for it. That is fine in my book. Though, word of warning, you might want to look up where the Chaos Emeralds are hidden, because it's just like Sonic 1 in this game. They're just hidden in the levels somewhere, and some of the places that they hide these Chaos Emeralds is, quite frankly, bullshit. So you're probably going to have to look it up if you have any hope of finding them all. And I guess I'll also briefly mention that the boss fights are pretty much the same deal as what was in Sonic 1. No coins, but that actually means you have to actually fight the boss, so they're kind of okay. Next up, we got Sonic Chaos, and I'm just gonna let it out right here off the beginning. This is my least favorite of the 8-bit Sonic games. I got a lot of problems with this game here. Starting off with the performance. Holy shit, this game runs so poorly. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, I recommend the Master System version uh, just for the wider resolution. The Game Gear version and Master System version are pretty much identical, so whatever, doesn't really matter. Anyway, yeah, performance. This game has constant slowdown. It runs so poorly. Like, when I was trying to compare the two versions of the game for performance differences to see if one version ran better than the other, neither did. They both run equally shitty. They are constantly dropping frames all the time. Even if there's nothing going on in the game or on screen, they're just dropping frame rate all the time. They control so poorly because of how choppily they run. They are just so rough to play. And it's unfortunate because in terms of like the physics and level design and all that stuff, we're pretty well in line with what was in Sonic 2. It's got the multi-tiered paths. It's got, you know, relatively okay simulation of Sonic physics. You know, we're still very far from it, but it does a serviceable enough job just like Sonic 2 did. Also, you know what's cool in this game? You got both the Spin Dash and the Super Peel Out, something that never happened in the 16-bit games in their original versions. But these devs that made these games were just like, yeah, sure, fuck it, give him all the moves from the other games. Though, just like the physics, they don't exactly work the same. Like, you don't charge either of them. You basically just start it and go, and it's already at maximum speed just from the beginning. But, you know, it's, they're there. That's something. And as you can probably tell, watching these boss fights right here, we're back to the 16-bit style of boss design, meaning that they suck and that they're over in seconds. But these bosses are honestly even worse than that. I mean, Jesus Christ, man, look at this. Though, to be fair, you could do this exact same thing in a number of bosses in those 16-bit games. So if anything, you could say this is very authentic to those games, which means the bosses in this game are just as bad. One thing that's kind of neat that this game introduces is it has some new power-ups made just for this game. You got these little rocket shoes that Sonic can get that lets you fly forward for a brief period of time, as well as this weird spring on a spring platform thing that you can stand on and it pogo bounces around and then you can jump off of it. Uh, these are kind of cool, those little platforming gimmicks, you know, it, it gives you access to new areas and stuff like that. They're kind of neat. I kind of like the idea. I could see these being implemented into the 16-bit games and working, so I'm fine with them. But this is the first 8-bit Sonic game where you actually have to get the Chaos Emeralds by doing special stages. But this game is very weird with its execution of how that works, because they don't do just platforming like they did in Sonic 1 for the special stages, and they don't do a mini-game like the 16-bit games, 
basically every special stage is its own unique thing. So like the first special stage is you use the rocket shoes to get to the end where the Chaos Emerald is, and then you have one where you use the spring shoes to get to another one, but then another one is just going through a pipe maze to find where the Chaos Emerald is, and these special stages are just like a mixed bag of just weird stuff. Like one of them is relatively normal platforming that you just have to get to the end, and then the other ones are all these weird gimmick things. It's just all over the place, and also there's only five Chaos Emeralds to get. And I'll tell you this, I really don't like how you access the special stages in this game, because the way it works in this game is you just collect a hundred coins, and that's it, boom! You just get sent to the special stage immediately, which means you don't actually get to finish the level that you were playing. If you hit a hundred coins, you go to the special stage, and then you move on to the next level. So you can basically, like, skip levels by going for special stages, like, what the fuck? That's messed up, man! I don't like that! So overall, it's a pretty weird way of getting the Chaos Emeralds this time around, and unfortunately, there's no reward, so there's no reason to do it. And I wouldn't say any of these mini-games are particularly fun, so you could probably just pass on them. But if you do that, then the game is incredibly short. If you only play the levels, you know, beginning to the end, trying to clear them as quickly as you can, pretty much every single level in this game is like 20 seconds long, maybe 30 tops, if you know what you're doing. This is a very, very short game. Uh, which is fine, you know, whatever. It's just an 8-bit game on the side that you can play if you want. At the end of the day, even though it runs like fuck, it's is still playable in my opinion, is relatively enjoyable, is fine. And also you can play as Tails in this one, so that's... something. Just like everything when it comes to the physics and control of these games, his flight does not work like it's supposed to in the 16-bit games. You can't start flying from the air, you can only do it from the ground, and it's like the peel-out input to do it, it's up and jump which is just weird, and also his flight, it doesn't feel good, it's just like, move in whatever direction you want. Whatever. You know, it's janky 8-bit Sonic. I think it's been well established at this point. Next up, Sonic Triple Trouble. Uh, it's fine. It's alright. It's not my favorite of these games, it's not the worst one, it's just in the middle, it's very average. Pretty much everything I've said up to this point applies to this game, you know. It kinda does Sonic level design, sort of. It kind of has physics that try to sort of emulate Sonic physics, but it's still very far. It's very janky, it runs poorly a lot of the time. It's still relatively fun, you know, par for the course for this point. So Sonic Triple Trouble was never actually released for the Master System, it was only on the Game Gear. Uh, but actually... Some cool-ass fans actually made their own port of the game to the Master System, and with that you get the nice higher resolution benefits of the Master System, so I recommend actually playing this fan Master System port version. I'll have a link to it in the description for you to go check out. One thing that's unique to this game is that whenever you go off like a spring or a ramp or anything like that, and Sonic is in the air in a non-bald state, you can actually hit jump in the air to curl into a ball for a brief period of time. And that's actually pretty cool. I would like if they implemented that sort of thing into the Sonic games proper, where you could curl and uncurl basically at any time. And this game is the closest thing we've ever gotten officially to that sort of thing, so... That's a little bit neat. They actually get a lot of mileage out of this little, like, curl in the air kind of thing, because they have lots of sequences where they spring you off into a wall that you can break through while curling, so you need to, you know, time your curling to make sure you actually go through the blocks and stuff like that. This is actually kind of cool! And I also discovered in my playthrough with Tails that he can also do something kind of interesting and weird. So in this game, his flight works just like Sonic Chaos. You can only do it from the ground, and it's just like, move in whatever direction you want. But if you go off a spring and you hit up and jump to get him to fly, he actually will do a little bit of a hover kind of thing. You can't make him ascend, it doesn't work like his normal flight, but he just gets like a little bit of extra boost. And his flight controls actually feel a little bit more like proper Sonic, where he, you know, moves up and then loses speed and starts descending. This is a very interesting little thing that he can do, like this, like, out of spring little extra boost is kind of a cool little thing. I like it. 
This game's level design, I'd probably say, is on the weaker side of these 8-bit Sonic games. Like, it's not horrible or anything, but it's nothing special, really. It's fine, it's serviceable. Like, Sonic 2, I actually think, had some pretty damn good level design in it. Uh, Sonic Chaos, it was okay, but the levels were incredibly short. Here, it's, 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 it's fine. It gets the job done. It carries over some of the things that were introduced in Sonic Chaos, like Sonic's little flight shoe things. And it also introduces some new stuff, like Sonic gets this little snowboard power-up he can use, which is kind of cool. It's like a snowboarding from Ice Cap from Sonic 3, except there's actually gameplay here, so, you know, that's okay. You also get these little underwater shoe things uh, for Sonic, but actually, interestingly, for Tails, you get slightly different power-ups, like when you go underwater for him, he gets his little submarine from Tails Adventure, and he can, like, shoot missiles and stuff. That's kind of fun. I like the idea of Tails actually getting to use his smarts and his gadgets in his gameplay. That's a fun idea. Special stages in this game are, again, pretty weird. There's two kinds of special stages. Ones that are just like traditional platforming, though with very odd and very irregular level design that they're not particularly good or fun levels, but uh, they're kind of a little bit like mazes. Like, you gotta figure your way to the end rather than, like, skillfully platform your way through tough obstacle courses. Uh... They're kind of whatever. And the other kind that they have is more of a traditional special stage minigame kind of thing, where you're flying in a plane, and you gotta collect the coins as they fly at you, and you need enough coins, and then you get yourself a Chaos Emerald. But both types of special stage actually have one little extra challenge after you, you know, get to the end or hit the coin requirement. Then you have to have a boss fight with Fang the Sniper, a new character introduced in this game. And he's basically just more boss fights, and they're just like all the other boss fights, and they're not particularly good. Uh, okay. Whatever. And for accessing the special stages in this game, it's again kind of weird. So you gotta get the 50 coins, but then somewhere hidden in the level is a monitor with a Chaos Emerald on it, and you gotta hit that monitor with 50 coins, and then some sparkles will appear, and you can jump into them to enter the special stage. So it's kind of like a mix of, like, the typical Sonic thing from, like, Sonic 1 and 2, mixed with, like, the 8-bit Sonic 1 and 2, where you just gotta find it somewhere. It's kind of weird, but I guess it works well enough. Oh yeah, and once again, no reward for collecting the Chaos Emeralds, so... Probably just pass on this as well. Uh, so Sonic Triple Trouble, it's fine. It's whatever. If you've played the other ones and you enjoyed them, you can play this one, too, and you'll enjoy this one as well. It's fine. But now, for the final 8-bit Sonic platformer, we gotta talk about Sonic Blast. And if you're not familiar with Sonic Blast, I'm gonna have to ask you to prepare yourself emotionally, because it's about to get rough. You're not ready for what you're about to see. If you're religious, you may want to pray, because here it comes. Yep, this is it. This is what it looks like. This is a real, official Sonic game that Sega published, and it looks like the ugliest fucking thing you've ever seen in your entire life. Absolutely. If you've ever seen people discussing what they think the worst Sonic games are, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, Sonic 06 or Shadow the Hedgehog or this or that. But the more informed people will usually say Sonic Blast, or maybe Sonic Jam for the GameCom, which I'm not covering in this series, by the way, because fuck that. That is too bad, even for me. But, uh, yeah, Sonic Blast. I think the visuals, uh, speak for themselves on the quality of this game. Or do they? Alright, now listen. I know that this game is like the most horrific thing you've ever seen in your entire life. I sympathize with you, I understand. My eyes are bleeding too. But, if you can get past the visuals, I actually think this is one of the best 8-bit Sonic games that they've made. Genuinely, I'm not joking! 
Most people, I think, when they play this game, they just cannot get past the visuals. And I don't really blame anyone, because they are really bad, and they can definitely cut into someone's enjoyment of the game. I totally understand that. But, in terms of the gameplay, it's actually pretty good. Like, physics-wise, this may actually be the best feeling of these games. Like, Sonic's acceleration and his speed and all that feels very, very refined. And your movement and control in the air, the height of your jumps, like, everything just feels really good. And the level design is not terrible. The levels are all pretty short, but is is pretty okay for the most part. There are some problems, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But if you can just get over the visuals, or maybe if you're a blind gamer, I think Sonic Blast is actually fairly enjoyable. And outside of the visuals, this game is pretty par for the course for these 8-bit games. You know, it's got a facsimile of Sonic level design and physics, and, you know, it's got zones and acts and all that stuff, and... You know, I wouldn't recommend time attacking it necessarily, but playing through it, it's, it's a fun little platformer. Interesting thing for this game is Sonic has a double jump in it, actually. That's like his air ability, which is unique and not done in any of the other original Sonic games. And, I mean, it feels pretty good. It's a pretty fun double jump because of Sonic's speed. You can cover pretty long distances with it. By the way, the version I'm playing here is the Master System version, which is a really bad port, and it honestly has quite a number of problems, but I still prefer it over the Game Gear version because of the wider field of vision that you get. Unfortunately, this game you can't use the Game Gear emulators to get Master System resolution. It just breaks for this game, so you're either stuck with a kind of jankier version of the game, or a smaller screen, which also makes it jankier. Personally, I prefer the wider screen space, so I recommend the Master System version. But they're both pretty on par, I would say, overall. The boss fights in this one are nothing to write home about, but they do have one cool thing that I actually quite like, and is unique just to Sonic Blast as far as these 2D games go, even including the 16-bit ones, which is that you have to actually hit Eggman in the cockpit of his vehicle in order to do damage. You can't just fling your hitbox at him nonsensically. You do actually kind of have to jump and aim for his cockpit. And that also gives you opportunity for using the physics a little bit. If you want to rebound and then land a second hit, it actually kind of feels a little bit more Sonic-y than even the 16-bit bosses. So something like this where you actually have to hit a weak spot is... Something that could have made these boss fights a lot better throughout this whole series, and this, of all games, is the one to do it. What the fuck? Uh, special stages in this game kind of work Sonic 3 style. You find a hidden big ring, quote-unquote. All the scale of everything is so weird in this game. Like, springs are so tiny. Like, what the hell happened? Like, it feels like this game wasn't supposed to have this pre-rendered look on the characters, and then they just, like threw it in there last minute and their sprites got oversized or something. I don't know, but whatever. Anyway, so once you find the big rings, you get into them, and then these special stages are equally as ugly as the normal game is. And it's a very simple, you just run forward, collect coins, jump, and you get enough, you get a Chaos Emerald. And even the fucking Chaos Emeralds are ugly as fuck in this game. Like, what even is that? Why does it look so bad? And collecting all the Chaos Emeralds in this game unlocks you access to... The final boss, which is fucking terrible, so I really would not recommend going for the Chaos Emeralds. The special stages aren't particularly fun and worthwhile to do just for their own sake, so... You can pass on those, but the game itself? Is not bad, and hey, this one actually has Knuckles as a playable character. No Tails in this one, because I guess Sonic and Knuckles was more relevant at the time or something. Although I think this game was the companion game to Sonic 3D Blast. Hence the name and the, you know, graphics being pre-rendered and stuff, but, uh, yeah. Your eyes may start to bleed as you play it, but I think it's actually a pretty fine game. And oh yeah, it does coins in a very interesting way, because they actually kind of work more like a health bar in this game, where you take a hit, and you don't lose all of your coins, you only lose ten of them, so it kind of acts like a health bar. Every ten coins you get, that's another hit you can take, and you still have the opportunity to recollect your coins. Uh, so that's a interesting little rethinking of, you know, the coin health system of these games. 
Is it better? I don't really know, but it's different, and that's interesting, I guess. Although, I have to give a big disclaimer with this game, which is that the last two zones of this game are fucking horrible. Blue Marine Zone is the worst zone in any Sonic game ever, period. This zone is fucking horrible. It's a water zone, and you know how bad those are in these games because they just run like shit to begin with, so the combination of the slowdown from the game and the slowdown from the water makes it so that you move unimaginably slowly, but then also the level design of this game is so bad because it is an underwater maze. You have to figure out how to get to the end of the level, and that involves taking lots of tubes and lots of water currents that launch you back further in the level, and you're just running around in this slow-motion water nightmare, and it is miserable. It is, it is true suffering. Anyone that has complained about Labyrinth Zone in Sonic 1, you know nothing. Like, the water zones in all of these games are pretty bad in general because just how they work, but this zone is hell itself. Like, fucking Christ, it is so bad. You have no idea if you haven't actually played it yourself. And the last zone, the Egg Palace zone, again, it's a maze and it's just not fun. You gotta try to use all these teleporters to find your way to the end and there's no way to know where the end is, so it's just trial and error taking every teleporter and trying to remember which teleporters you did take and which ones you didn't, and it's just not fun. Honestly, I would recommend, once you get to Blue Marine Zone, just stop playing the game. You're good, you're fine, you don't need to play anymore. You can just stop there. It's fine. And with that, we have covered all of the 8-bit Sonic 2D platformers. Overall, I mean, I think they're all decent little games. Nothing particularly spectacular or amazing. But if you enjoy 2D platformers and you like Sonic, I think that they're at least worth giving a look. You might enjoy some of them. I guess my ranked list for these games would be probably Sonic Chaos at the bottom, and then Sonic Triple Trouble, and then Sonic Blast, and then Sonic 1, and Sonic 2 at the top. That one, I would say, is actually genuinely very good and just worth playing in general as kind of a Sonic game. You know, the physics are still not really there, but it's pretty good. So bam, look at that. We got the four main Sonic games, and now we have five more that are varying levels of decent on top of that. So, so far, I would say that the title of this series is holding true. Up to this point, Sonic has been pretty damn good. Let's see how the rest of the series goes.